I'm sure in some way or another you have probably heard this phrase, I put my city on the map. Maybe you're not uh, a fan of rap music, I get that, but it doesn't just come from the rappers and hip hoppers, it uh, comes from athletes and movie stars, it really comes from anyone who thinks they're a big deal and they're certain that their success and their recognition have in some way contributed to the visibility or the reputation of their respective cities. And it's true that some are very braggadocious, while others are quiet about it, and people make those associations themselves. But what I wanted to do this morning is just a little exercise, a little word association. This will probably determine how much TV you watch, so maybe you don't say anything, or how familiar you are with culture. So let's start with a guy that I know everyone in here loves, LeBron James. LeBron James, uh, he is often said to be that kid from Akron, Ohio. Michael Jordan, a lot of people love Michael Jordan, and they associate him with a particular city. And you know what that city is not that they associate him with? is the place that he was actually born, Brooklyn. A lot of folks don't know that Michael Jordan was born in Brooklyn. Less do they know that he was actually raised in Wilmington, North Carolina. But Michael Jordan is often associated with what city? Chicago. And then there's Serena Williams, who is one of Compton's finest. Musicians, if I said the word uh, Sinatra, what city are you thinking of? Vegas? How about Bob Marley? Associate Bob Marley with Jamaica? The Beatles? Jess? Liverpool? How about the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley? Oftentimes, you talk about Elvis and you're connecting him to Memphis, even though he was born in Mississippi. There's other artists and popular people. Frida Kahlo, maybe you don't know Frida, but when you say that name, Mexico City. The Apple founder and CEO, Steve Jobs, Cupertino, Clint Eastwood, Carmel, Thomas Kincaid, Carmel. Maybe you say, hey, I'm the, I'm the king of Marina or Seaside. Well, what about Jesus? What city was he famous for putting on the map? Well, what city do you think was claiming Jesus, proud of Jesus as the city's representative? It certainly wasn't Nazareth the place where he was raised. And as we come to our text this morning in Luke chapter 4, and verses 14 through 30, we encounter what I call a not-so-welcome homecoming for Jesus. You see, Luke has arranged his material in such a way that after Jesus' baptism, which we looked at a couple weeks ago, and after his triumph over Satan in the wilderness, which we looked at last week, he now comes in Luke's record to his hometown of Nazareth, and he comes teaching in the synagogue. But his reception by his own people, his own hometown, is less than ideal. And so would you please stand with me, and we'll read Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. Here's God's word. For us. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district, and he was teaching in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and marveling at the gracious words which were coming forth from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard took place at Capernaum, do also in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you, in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they stood up and drove him out of the city and led him to the edge of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went on his way. You may have a seat. Would you please join me as we ask the Lord to bless the teaching of his word. Oh, Father, there is truth contained in your eternal word for us this morning. And so we pray collectively, individually, that you would give us soft hearts to receive your truth, sensitive ears to hear, and a bended will to obey. Oh Lord, help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our main idea this morning, if you're taking notes, is this thought here. Jesus proclaims that he is the promised Messiah who brings salvation to those in need. And the message for you and I is don't be like those who think that we don't have a need. Jesus proclaims that he is the promised Messiah who brings salvation to those in need, and you and I would make a gigantic mistake if we didn't include ourselves in that description as those who have desperate need. You see, the good news of Jesus Christ is only good news if you think the news applies to you. It's only good news if you know the bad news that you are not good. And that what you really need more than anything else in the world is the things, the very things that we sang about. God's grace, God's mercy. And so the outline that will follow for our exposition is just, again, three points. First, we'll look at verses 14 and 15. And there what we see is Jesus' power and the praise. And then point number two, Jesus' pronouncements. And again, the praise in verses 16 through 22. And then we'll come to the end of the section where we discover Jesus' parable. And instead of there being praise, there's rejection in verses 23 through 30. So Jesus' power and praise, his pronouncement and praise, and then the parable, and then the rejection. So let's begin with point number one. Jesus' power and praise. Put your eyes there again on verse 14. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Again, the area in which he grew up. And, and Luke chose to begin this narrative of Jesus' ministry in Galilee by not recording the first events that actually took place during Jesus' public ministry. We learn about that in John chapter 2 through John chapter 4. See, what takes place 
here happens weeks, maybe even months after his original ministry in Capernaum. You say, well, how do we know that if Luke goes right from the temptation to Nazareth? <clears throat> well, we know that because look at verse 23. It says, whatever we heard took place at Capernaum, do also here in your hometown as well. That's what the people were saying. And we ask, well, what was happening in Capernaum? Well, there were miracles of healing. There was Jesus' authority over unclean spirits. And this was known to the people in Nazareth in Jesus' hometown, but he had yet done a miracle in his own hometown. And so what we discover here is that in chapter 4, verses 14, all the way up to 44, there's a particular focus, and the focus is on Jesus' preaching and teaching. It's not so much on his works, that there will be plenty of observation for us as we move throughout Luke's gospel. But right now, in particular, Luke is stressing Jesus' words. And really, it's a, it's a preview of what Jesus will do throughout his Galilean ministry. He's going to go from synagogue to synagogue, and he's going to preach, and he's going to teach. And you say, well, how many synagogues were there? Well, there are probably over 200 synagogues in the region. And he's going around from town to town to town, preaching the word. And notice how he's preaching. The Bible here says that it's in the power of the Spirit. And again, you can ask real simply, how is Jesus filled with the Spirit when he's God? Shouldn't he always be filled with the Spirit? Yes, but the intention is for us to recognize that Jesus didn't do anything apart from the Holy Spirit. And so he was baptized with the Spirit. He's filled with the Spirit. He's led by the Spirit. He's energized by the Spirit. He overcomes Satan by the power of the Spirit. He's teaching in the Holy Spirit. He's helping. He's healing. The whole point is there's nothing that Jesus does apart from the Spirit of God. And listen, just so you're aware, we, we, we're all about the Holy Spirit here. We might define it differently than some churches do. But the truth of the matter is, is that being filled with the Spirit is actually not a suggestion. It is not some, some helpful advice. No, it's actually a command. Ephesians 5.18, don't be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. And yes, we know Jesus himself is the Messiah. He's God in the flesh, but it's important that you hear that there is nothing that Jesus does in his ministry apart from the Spirit of God. And when we open up the book of Acts and we read about the apostles having great success and people coming to faith and the, the phenomenal preaching that the apostles are doing and thousands are coming to Christ, it is not apart from the Spirit's work in those individuals. Now, if you remember back to last week, Luke had just described Jesus' victory over Satan in the wilderness. And before that, we had his baptism. And again, we haven't encountered any of this public ministry, so let's just think real quickly what all this news and this, this hoopla was about regarding Jesus. Again, when you look there at the text and uh, Luke 4.14, 4, there, there's, there's a gap there. There's about a, a year of ministry in Judea. And when you flip back on over to the Gospel of John, this is what we learn, that John the Baptist, after he baptized him, Jesus comes back and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then Jesus calls his first disciples. There's Andrew who goes and finds his brother Peter. And it's not just those two, because there's also Philip who goes and finds Nathaniel. And Nathaniel, when he hears about this Messiah, he asks a pretty crucial question. And the question is, can anything good come out of where? Nazareth. He's going to find out. And then those disciples accompany him to the wedding of Canaan, where he performs his first miracle. And after he does that first miracle, he goes to the temple and he does the first cleansing. And then in John chapter 3, you know this well, the Nick at night conversation. Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus and he stresses the importance of being born of the Spirit. 
And then in chapter 4 of John's Gospel, we learn that on his way back up to Galilee, instead of taking the detour that most Jews do, instead, what does he do? He goes through Samaria and he evangelizes a woman there at the well. And her testimony about Jesus is amazing. It's so significant as she goes back and and tells the people of that city, this man told me everything about me. He, he's got to be different. And they invite him to stay in their region of Samaria, which no Jew would ever do. And he's there for two days. And we read these words in John chapter 4, verse 42. They tell her, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is truly the Savior of the world. And from there, Jesus again comes to Cana of Galilee where he healed the royal official's son who was sick in Capernaum. And so there's plenty of stuff that went on that Nazareth has, Nazareth has heard about, and now they want a little bit of that action. We've heard the stories. You're beginning to garner a reputation. We want to see it. Show it to us. There's intrigue. And as a result of his early ministry, he was being praised, it says in the text, by the people. And this news, again, was just, it was spreading his miracles, his teaching. Look there at verse 15. And he was teaching in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And the question we have to ask is, what kind of glorifying was going on here? Your translation might say, he was being praised by all. Now, part of what they would have no doubt been praising is the authority in which he taught. You see, Jesus, when he gets up to, to preach, he's not quoting John MacArthur. He's not quoting John Piper. He's not, he's not quoting the, the, the rabbis of the day. Jesus is speaking in his own authority. It rarely will I come up here and wax eloquent some new biblical insights, just so you're aware. That's not to say that I don't work hard at exegesis. I have a group of guys and we're block diagramming and we're trying to, to sharpen each other by thinking critically about the word. I consult commentaries and languages and listen to, to plenty of pastors preaching on a text. But, but I'm not coming with grand new insights. I'm depending on the Holy Spirit. But listen, Jesus doesn't have to go to commentators. Everything that Jesus says is accurate. It's perfect. All, all preachers who are preaching today, we were simply the waiters who are trying not to mess up with the cook cooked up. Just trying to bring it to the table and serve it without messing it up. But Jesus is the cook. It's his word. And his word is authoritative. And so in verses 14 and 15, we see... Jesus' power. He's empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's preaching. He's teaching in the synagogues. He's being praised by all. And now we come to point number two, the pronouncement and the praise. It says there in verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and he opened up the scroll and found the place where it is written, now, before we get to what Jesus read, it is also important for us to remember that Jesus is here in the synagogue, and this is his normal practice. This is his custom. Every Sabbath, Jesus is there. I just think it's significant to point out that he didn't skip synagogue. Now, there weren't other more important things going on that Jesus just wasn't involved in a local gathering. You see, too many folks claiming to be Christians, and yet they rarely, sometimes never, actually go to church. And it makes us question, if you say you have a relationship with Christ, if you say that you love Christ, why would you not gather with Christ's people to worship him corporately as the Bible commands? Just the other day, I was wearing my Essential Church shirt. It's a documentary that's coming out this August, which explores some of the challenges between the church and our government 
throughout history. But it was clear as I was walking around town wearing this shirt that people didn't like it. Because you can hear the scoffs and you can hear people talking under their breath and people shaking their head and rolling their eyes. But listen, church is not optional. Gathering is not a suggestion. For too many, they have this, I could take it or leave it. I can have my own personal relationship with Jesus. I can just do church at home. Look, Jesus probably disagreed with some things going on in the synagogue. I mean, imagine, he's perfect. He knows the word perfectly. And then not every rabbi that got up to read something or teach something was fully accurate. Now, not every relationship in the synagogue was perfect. And yet Jesus is there. Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath. Just because people were imperfect, just because the preacher was imperfect, just because the things that were sung or, or the things that he heard were imperfect, it doesn't mean that he stopped gathering. So whenever possible... He is with the people of God, worshiping God. Listen, if you know someone who's calling themselves a Christian, but they don't like church or they really go to church, it's probably time that you prayerfully, patiently, gently, but firmly challenge them on that. Now you say, well, Don, what, what does synagogue look like compared to church nowadays? Thanks for asking. Here, here we go. Synagogues, they don't have pastors. They have what's called presiding officers. Those officers are the ones who lead worship. And because they didn't have pastors, what would normally happen is you would have people traveling. And they would have these itinerant rabbi teachers who would go from synagogue to synagogue to teach and listen, we don't know a ton about what first century synagogue life was like because this is actually the only place where we have record from the first century. But in later centuries, we're told that typically there's a reciting of the Shema. Shema, Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echad. Everyone said the same thing. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And after they said the Shema, they had a prayer of thanksgiving. Then the presiding officer would walk on over to the Holy Ark and they would pull out a scroll. And the first scroll that would come out would be the Torah. And there would be a reading in the Torah and a little commentary. Then they roll the scroll back up. They take it back. They get another scroll, the prophets, and it would come and someone would stand up and they would read from the prophets with an exposition. And after the exposition, then the attendant would probably stand, give the ironic benediction, and they would be on their way. Now, on this occasion, what we see here is that Jesus has an opportunity to read the text and give an exposition. And so Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah is handed to him, and he unrolls it himself. And he finds the place in Isaiah 61. He intentionally goes there. He finds the passage, and he reads now, at this point, it'd be really nice to see what it says here in Luke and what it actually says in Isaiah 61, because as you compare those two texts, it's interesting what is omitted and what is added. And before we say, hey, Jesus is adding to the word of God, well, he's including another passage in Isaiah, and he's also not including something that Isaiah 61 said for a very good purpose. So, so if we look at those here, that's small for me. Can you see that? Okay. There in Luke, in bold, we have an addition that he's going to give recovery of sight to the blind and set free those who are oppressed. If you look there in Isaiah 61, it says that he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. But the interesting omission is verse 2 of Isaiah 61. Because after it says to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh, then it says, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. So you just put that little side-by-side -side comparison. 
We identified that there's an addition that comes from Isaiah 58, 6, which talks about the Messiah setting free those who are oppressed. But it really is the omission that grabs our attention. You say, why did Jesus not quote the whole thing? Why did he not go all the way through in verse 2? And listen, it's not because Jesus is unaware of it. Nor does he skip it because he doesn't affirm the truth that's taught there. Jesus is a firm believer that God's judgment is coming. In fact, he knows that he's the one that's going to be sent to judge. Now, the reason he didn't quote it is because during his first advent, his mission was not to come and judge, but to come and save. John 3, 17, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. You see, his mission on earth during his first advent was to secure salvation, not to bring condemnation. But make no mistake, there's a second advent, a second coming, where people will run out of time to repent and believe. Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. And when he comes a second time, he's coming with judgment. Well, let's take a look here at why Jesus chooses to read this particular text. Because I think as we ask the question, why this text, Jesus, it becomes clear that he's laying out for us his mission here on earth. And the ministry, the mission is a good news ministry. You see, the gospel, the good news, it is news of comfort, and we say this at Christmas, joy and salvation. You see, the person that Isaiah 61 speaks of brings with him deliverance. And Jesus is saying, this one, this one, is me. It's not just theoretical. It's not just out there. But salvation, redemption, rescue, that is me. I am him. And you say, what audacity. How can you say this has been fulfilled in your ears. I mean, think about what Jesus is saying here. Not only is he a herald of this good news, but he is saying, I am the object of this good news. You know, we read the scriptures and oftentimes people are pointing to Jesus, pointing to him. John the Baptist is pointing to Jesus. Jesus is not pointing to anyone else. He says, I'm the point. Everyone is pointing to me because I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. This claim here is so significant because really what it does is it gives us an overview of his mission and ministry. It answers the question, what did the Messiah come to do? Why did he come to earth? And every Sunday, we recite our mission statements. And in a similar fashion, this right here is Jesus' mission statement. But there's something we have to be very clear about because some have read this text and said that this has to be the church's mission statement. It has to be the individual Christian's mission statement as well. And while that is mostly true, there's a couple of caveats that we need to bring clarity to. Because some have used this text to say that, well, the mission statement for the Christian, for the church, is social justice. Kevin DeYoung and Greg Gilbert wrote an excellent book titled, What is the Mission of the Church? Making Sense of Social Justice, Shalom, and the Great Commission. And I would just commend that to you. It's an excellent resource if you're asking that question. What is the church's purpose? See, if there's one thing we can't get wrong... It's what we as a church should be doing. And not just our local church, but all of the churches. There are many church leaders and, and many churches that have become so disillusioned by traditional church. And so they 
get rid of all the boring stuff. Get rid of the hymns, get rid of the preaching, get rid of the teaching. We need to be about love and serving. We need to be about soup kitchens. We need to be about re- releasing the, the affliction of the poor. And you say, well, Dom, are, are you not about that? Of course I am. Of course I am. But when we think about the church's primary purpose, the next question we have to ask is, what was Jesus' primary purpose? You see, because it's not just about the social aspects, it's about the spiritual aspects. You see, the key question we have to ask is this, who are we trying to reach with the gospel? Who needs the gospel? That is the question Are we trying to reach the poor, the oppressed, the downtrodden? And you say what? Absolutely. But we're also trying to reach the wealthy, the well-off, and the advantaged. And you say, well, Dom, I don't see that in the text. It's there. But every time we think of the wealthy, the well-off, and the advantaged, we don't think that they're actually poor, blind, and oppressed. But they are. Because if they don't have the spiritual eyes to see their need for Christ, then they're worse off than being physically poor, but seeing their need for Christ. Our mission is to the lost, and it is the lost that need the gospel, both rich and poor, both oppressed and non-oppressed. Listen, everybody is in the same camp the inability to please Christ and earn his favor. Everyone's there. There may be some more that are objectively evil or wicked, but the Bible is very clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So how are we to approach our mission? And this is, again, where I think we need to take our cues from Jesus. What did he do? What was the method of his ministry And the answer is right here in the text in front of us. Look there at what Jesus reads. And pay particular attention to the four verbs that are used. These are what we call verbal infinitives. The question is, what did Jesus come to do? What did the Spirit of God anoint Jesus to do? And it says there in verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to... Euangelizo, in the infinitive form, to proclaim good news. That's the gospel to the poor. And he has sent me to Keruso, to preach release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Apostello, to send away those who are oppressed, to get rid of their oppression Verse 19, again, to Caruso, to preach the favorable year of the Lord. And so the question is, how are the poor helped and the captives released and the blind made to see? And how are the oppressed comforted? And the answer is, by preaching the gospel. We don't preach the word just to fill our heads with Bible trivia. There are churches that do that. There are people that love that. No, but we preach because that's the only way someone is going to get saved. Romans 10. How will they call on him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of of those who proclaim good news of good things. And verse 17, you know it well. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And listen, just to be clear, by preaching, by teaching, by proclaiming, that doesn't mean that everyone has to get up here in the pulpit. That simply means that you have to know the gospel yourself, both intellectually and experientially, have a concern for people's lost souls, understand Jesus' mission and his desire to see people saved, and then you go and proclaim the same news. And notice that this preaching of the gospel, it's connected here with the favorable year of the Lord. And so the question is, well, what what does that mean? 
What is the favorable year of the Lord? And this week in your grace groups, and you heard Jordan say there's only a few more, but I just encourage you if you're not going to go, because this week you'll dive deep into Leviticus chapter 25, where you'll learn about the favorable year of the Lord. But here's just a quick little overview to help you understand that this is a reference to what's called the year of Jubilee. Okay, the, the year of Jubilee. Every week you've got six days that you're working, labor, and then you rest on the seventh. This happens for every six years, and then there's a seventh year, which was a follow year where the, the, the Israelites were commanded not to till the ground, to leave their fields uncultivated as a sign of trust, as a sign of gratitude. And then when you figure out that there's more years, all the way up to year 50, you have what's called the year of Jubilee. And you say, Don, what's the year of Jubilee? Well, as far as humanly possible, the year of Jubilee, everything was returned to the way that it ought to be. Meaning that those who sold themselves into slavery by way of necessity or those who had land taken from them, all of that would be restored. And because the year of Jubilee occurred only once every 50 years, it's not like this just happened all the time. It was once in a lifetime and it was cause of great celebration because debts were completely canceled. Imagine that, all of you who have school debt, that all your debt is canceled but without the, the, the help of the government. The, the, the debts are canceled. The slaves are set free. Your land is restored. And listen, in the spiritual sense, Jesus said that with his arrival, the year of Jubilee had arrived. With Christ coming, the Spirit was working in him to bring about great spiritual renewal and release. You see, this would be a time when the good news of liberation was no longer a hope but it was a reality. The oppression that we have been under, there is now someone finally who is able, who is strong enough to release us, to grant us freedom, to provide liberation. Jesus is saying that this favorable year of the Lord was just a precursor, was a pointer to point to me who ultimately is the one who restores, who forgives your debts, who reconciles, who brings peace, who brings rest. And again, notice that Jesus ends on that high note. He stops short of quoting the other day, which is the day of vengeance. We'll look there at verse 20. He closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant. He sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today. Now, this isn't a 50-minute sermon, by the way. Uh, this is really just a one-sentence sermon application. But today, not in Isaiah's day, right here, right now, in your hearing, in front of you, with my words, in person, this isn't secondhand information. This scripture has been fulfilled. See, Jesus is saying that he's not just the messenger, but he is the message itself. I am the one that God has sent, anointed, enabled by the Holy Spirit, to fulfill these promises and provide a salvation to destitute, captive, blind, broke people. I am the deliverer. I'm the one that provides spiritual salvation. And you say, well, what's the response? Once again, more praise. Verse 22, and all were speaking well of him and marveling at the gracious words which were coming from his lips. In that response, there's two things just to note that this is something that was repeatedly happening over and over. It's in the imperfect tense. They're bearing witness to how, how great his words are. He's showering his words on them. I mean, this is Nazareth's finest. 
that they are wanting to put Jesus up on the billboard outside because they love Jesus' message. They love the idea that God promised salvation. They, they love the truthfulness of what Jesus was affirming. Israel longed for God's salvation. And here is young Jesus standing up and telling it like it is. But even though there's that initial positive response, we learn very quickly by that question mark. Verse 22, and they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? You see, they were satisfied with the promise of salvation, but they actually stumbled over the one who was proclaiming it. What they witness and the wonder they caused easily gave way to bewilderment. This, this, can't, this can't be right. This, this can't be true. We, we grew up with him. We, we know that this is Joseph's son. Jesus, we love what you're saying. It's fantastic. But we're familiar with you. If you have ears to hear, Listen to what the Spirit is saying. There are so many people, maybe even sitting here, who are very familiar with the Bible, very familiar with Jesus' works and his words and his actions, very familiar with Bible stories that you can retell from memory, and yet you truly don't know him. One writer said, the mood of wonder and praise quickly turned with whispers and nods and even scowls to doubt and hostility, a rapid and radical transformation of emotion in the audience. Listen, sometimes the truth is just in plain sight. It's right in front of us. And the reason why people have not bowed the knee to Jesus is because they have bought into a lie that they know him when they don't. Listen. One of my obsessions was someone by the name of Kobe Bryant. Graduated the same year. Loved that guy. He was an amazing basketball player. I can tell you about his long body of work, how impressive his feats were, all of his accomplishments. But I don't know Kobe Bryant personally. And Kobe Bryant is now dead. And I think that's how people know Jesus. They don't truly know him. They don't truly know that he's living. Well, finally, let's look at Jesus' response to all this. Point number three, Jesus' parable and rejection in verse 23. He said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. What we heard take place at Capernaum, do also here in your hometown. And this word here for proverb is really just that word parable. There's a deeper spiritual truth being communicated here. The people want Jesus to put his money where his mouth is. If you're going to make such an audacious claim, Jesus, back it up. Prove it to us. We've heard of the rumors of the miracles you performed 20 miles from here. Do it now in front of us, and maybe we'll believe you. The fickle crowd will say the same thing to Jesus when he's on the cross. In Luke chapter 23, the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were scoffing at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ of God. His chosen one. You see, physician, heal yourself is really just a confession of unbelief. And Jesus confronts that attitude with these words. Truly I say to you that no prophet is welcome in his hometown. You would think they would have been excited, elated, so thrilled that the prophet of God is speaking to them in their presence. You would think that he would be highly regarded, appreciated, at least respected, and yet that's not the case, because familiarity breeds what? Contempt. He's just Joseph's son. Now here comes the real parable. Look at the rest of what Jesus' response is there. Those in the synagogue that day were 
much like Israel during the period of the kings. And this is why Jesus takes them to these passages. It's a period in Israel's history when the nation was the most obstinate. They're following people like Ahab and Jezebel and, and bowing to the Baals. And so Jesus says in verse 25, But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel's day of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. You see, Elijah and Elisha, the prophets of God, they were sent to the Gentiles with good news, not because the good news was not for Israel. It was. But the good news had always been for all people. And Israel was supposed to rejoice that God was a gracious God, a forgiving God. And when Israel rejected the good news and they lived in disobedience, God just said, I will send my blessing to the Gentiles. And that's what he did. God blessed a destitute Gentile, not someone who was part of the elite, not an Israelite, not someone in the in crowd, but a poor Gentile woman. And it wasn't just that generation of Elijah and those, in the, those Israelites during that time, but this hard-heartedness continued onto the next generation. And so we read during the ministry of Elisha, look at verse 27, and there were many lepers in Israel. In the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Elisha too was sent to the Gentiles, but this time, a Syrian, a man of war, and he's a leper. You know what that calculates in a Jewish mind? That guy deserves what he's getting, that guy's despicable. He's not just outside of God's blessing. He's way outside of God's blessing. Flip on over real quickly to 2 Kings chapter 5. Let me just show you this. 2 Kings chapter 5. The slave girl comes to Naaman, talks up Elisha. The servants trying to help their master trust the word of God through Elisha. Verse 8, now it happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious and he went away and said, behold, I say to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of Yahweh and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Ab Abna and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? And so he turned and went away in, what does that word say? In wrath. Verse 13, then his servants approached and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet spoken with you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? And so he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Verse 15, Then he returned to the man of God with all his camp, and came and stood before him, and said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. So now, please take a blessing from your servants. 
the attitude of the widow, the attitude of Naaman, Naaman not believing at first, resisting at first, indignant at first, but humbling himself. Humbling himself and finding God's blessing. The opposite is true for these people in Nazareth. Because they're praising him. They, they love what he's saying. They love the message. But as soon as they realize that there's a requirement to embrace the Messiah, to acknowledge that they are the ones that are blind, broke, oppressed, they say, nuh-uh, we don't need that. And they grow in their rage. Look at verse 28. The people, all the people, which means this is without exception, as one voice, they are filled with rage as they heard these things. And you say, why? Why not celebration? Why not rejoicing? Why, why are they not lauding God's grace to those who are hungry and sick? It's because they have the spirit of Jonah. God says, go and preach to Nineveh. Jonah says, no, they don't deserve your grace. They don't deserve mercy. And God's word to Jonah, Jonah, do you have a right to be mad? Jonah says in Jonah 4, 2, Oh, Yahweh, was it not this my word to myself while I was still in my own land? Therefore, I went ahead and flew, flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God that you are slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning evil. And Jonah should have said yes and amen, that you would be gracious. But the problem is that Jonah didn't see the depth of his own sin. And so when you don't see the depth of your own sin, you don't think anyone else deserves forgiveness. God revealed himself to Moses in Exodus 34, 6. When Yahweh passed in front of him, he called out, Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. And listen, the scary truth is that we love when God is gracious to us. We love when he's merciful to us, but not so much to those that we don't think deserve it. Brothers and sisters, if we have this attitude, we need to repent. This is what keeps you from sharing the gospel with other people. That posture reveals a heart that does not understand the magnitude of grace. Later on in Luke chapter 7, Jesus is going to go to Simon's house. And there's going to be a woman that comes and falls at his feet. And she's pouring out her tears and she's worshiping him. And Simon's thinking in his head, if this man were truly a prophet, he would know what sort of woman this is. That she's a sinner. And Jesus, like the great prophet that he is, reading Simon's thoughts says, Simon, I came in here. You gave me no greeting. You gave me nothing to wash my feet. She hasn't stopped wetting my feet with her tears. And then he teaches them this lesson. He who is forgiven little, loves little. The expression of her love right now is an understanding that she knows how much she's been forgiven. But you will not bow your heart to me because you don't think that you need to be forgiven of anything. And that's exactly what's going on here in Nazareth. They thought they were fine. Verse 29. They stood up. They drove him out of the city. They led him to the edge of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down off of the cliff. How fickle. Praise. Yay. Our champion. Our hometown hero. 
I don't like what you had to say. Away with you. Notice those words, drove and led. It's the Spirit of God that did the same thing for Jesus. The Spirit drives him into the wilderness and leads him to victory over Satan. This is why it's so important for us to walk by the Spirit and not the flesh. Because if you allow the flesh to go to work, they'll do the same thing. They'll drive Jesus off and lead him to the cliff, which is ultimately what happened as he went to the cross. But there's something that they forgot. No one takes his life from him. He lays it down on his own accord. Verse 30, but passing through their midst, he went on his way. Well, as we come to a close, I found this website that you can go and entertain yourself with. It allows you to see a map of the world and you can scroll around the map and you can find out where all the famous people are from. From kings to queens to presidents and politicians to movie stars, musicians and athletes, they're all there. I'm sure you can sympathize with my shock when I went around searching Israel and then I made my way up to Nazareth. And there he was, Jesus. I guess in some ways I was just thankful that they put him up there. They certainly had Obama, and Donald Trump, Lots of movie stars they had there. But when I clicked on my Savior's name, I read Notability Rank 204. Gender male. Is he alive? Nope. You see, it's not just his hometown that rejected Jesus. We live in a world that is continually rejecting Jesus. Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And for those of you who love the Savior, you say, absolutely. The Savior of the world came out of Nazareth. The one who's forgiven all of my sins came out of Nazareth. The only one who is worthy of adoration and praise. The one who can promise eternity, a hope of the future where there is no more pain, suffering, sorrow, or tears. He came out of Nazareth. Oh, church, do you love him? Let's pray. Father, it grieves my heart that Jesus was in his own hometown. People who saw him, people were, who were beneficiaries of his woodwork, people who heard him tell stories, people who held him in their arms when he was a baby. So many had interaction with the Savior. And Lord, when we think about that, we often think, how could they have missed him? And yet that is true even today. So many in the church, young and old, who have some familiarity with Jesus, but they don't truly know him. Oh, Father, would that never be true of us? Would you please soften our hearts to accept every word that comes from your mouth? Would you help us to bow low to the authority of your word? To agree with it, that we are sinners in need of so much grace. And Father, we're reminded this morning that for those that have put their faith in Christ, that we have an eternal reward. And it's not just heaven, and oftentimes I talk about no more pain, suffering, tears, sorrow, heartache, disappointment, and death. But really, the main goal, the main aim, the main treasure is Jesus himself. Oh Lord, how we long to be with you. Whom do we have in heaven? But you. You are our reward. 
You are our prize. You are our joy. Lord, would you help us to constantly encourage while the day is still called today, and that we spur one another on to love you more. We pray this in your precious name. Amen.